Welcome to One Sharp Sword, cutting through to what matters most. Today is a special day. I'm Dr. P, Dr. Wayne Purnell, your host, your guide on this journey, and your the outfluencer and your powerful presence mentor. With me today is a super special guest. Wendy Ryan has an extensive history in human resources, organization development, diversity, and executive coaching. She does a ton more than that. She's got a new book coming out. I can't wait to talk about this. Her background and my background seem very similar in so many ways. There's a lot of overlap. And when I had the opportunity, when this was presented to me, I said, I want Wendy on the show. So, Wendy, welcome to One Sharp Sword. Thank you, Wayne. It's great to be here. <laughs> it's, it's great to have you. So talk a little bit about, you didn't just land in HR. You didn't just land, like you, something got you there. Uh, before the show we were talking about, we're both Aggies, which means that we both went to UC Davis at at different times because I'm just a little older than you. Um I don't know about that, but it's possible. <laughs> it's likely. <laughs> um, so you you got into HROD, actually, as part of your graduate studies. What did you study as an undergrad? An, a, an undergrad. So like so many people, I think still, uh, I changed my major three times as an undergrad. So... Where I finally ended up is realizing that psychology was a great fit for me and Spanish was a great fit for me. So I double majored in psychology and Spanish, and I had this thought that I should go be a therapist. And then I thought, but wait, I really love business. I enjoy, I grew up, uh, my stepdad was a CEO. And I just loved that world. And I thought, maybe I ought to get some real world experience before I go run and get a PhD in psychology and become a therapist. So that's what I did and uh, never looked back. So once I started working in business in HR, I just kept going. And so the therapist idea kind of fell by the wayside. That's amazing. Um, what what kind of business? You grew up watching your stepdad be an executive, so you knew how he thought and how he operated. What kind of business was that that you, that you were able to observe at first? Well, he was a public company CEO. It wasn't a huge company, but it was a company that manufactured devices that are used in telecommunication switching. So this was back in the day before we had voice over IP and, you know, kind of the, the digitized world we live in now and that you and I are speaking over. And uh, it, it really was, was interesting to, to grow up with him on the one hand in that world, my mom as a nurse in the other and so I think very much the influences that I had were part healer and then part business person. And so when I think about my career trajectory from there forward, it makes a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense. That's awesome. Yeah. So you got into HR and I... I my history with HR is a little different in that I was doing some consulting uh, with Whole Foods Market and they invited me to apply uh, for their executive team. And I became the director of HR for the Northern Pacific region. And I think both uh, the president and I, within probably the first few months, realized that this was not the best path for me. And, <laughs> and, and so my tenure in as the director of HR was about a year. And what I realized was I'm a big possibility thinker and HR isn't always that. And this a was pre, the box pre <laughs> yes. yeah. this was pre Bezos, right? So it was before it was when, a, when uh, Whole Foods was still, you know, they, they had 
a, a kind of a different trajectory, which was really, I at the time, quite positive. What, um, not that now is not, it's just different. <laughs> so for me, HR, I found that HR wasn't a fit, even though I also was doing OD, organization development. What, how did you blend that so well? How did that become such a passion of yours? You know, I, I did go through a couple of different roles at a couple of different companies in the span of a couple of years. So I'm, I'm familiar with that, you know, trying to find the right fit. And I ended up the last four years that HR was really my, my primary focus. I was at Trinet, which is a an outsourced provider of HR. And People have different feelings and views on, on PEOs, but at the time I was there, it was the late 90s, and it was the Wild West as far as the dot-com boom. And we were doing some really innovative things like enrolling people in benefit plans online, you know, letting people get online to make changes to their payroll information. And this was really new and exciting at the time. And the opportunity that that really helped me solidify and what I like to do is I did a lot of consulting um, as someone who was managing field services for uh, first Silicon Valley region and then later East Coast, I got to meet a ton of leaders, a ton of CEOs of small businesses who are doing lots of interesting things and trying to figure out how do I do the least amount of HR stuff possible? But once we took care of kind of the benefits and payroll part of the platform, it was like, wait a minute, there's all these other things. What, what do I do about this issue that these people are having? Or how come my team doesn't work well together? Or, um, you know, why can't we seem to find the talent that we, we feel like we really need? And so I really gravitated towards solving those kinds of problems, which I think in today's lexicon, you and I might talk about those as culture work, as organization development work, um, leadership development. So that's kind of how I found my home, but it wasn't necessarily a traditional HR trajectory within a single company. That's fantastic. That's that's. Oh, awesome. My uh, my path to OD, also organization development, was accidental and incidental, right? Started doing culture work before OD was actually a thing. And it's great. I mean, when, when you can make a difference in the life of a company yeah. and touch the lives of individuals, that's hugely fulfilling, which is why I thought, oh, director of HR, that'd be great. And it, it's easier as a consultant. It's easier to come in and say, I see the major organization. I see the organization as a whole. Where, where are you finding the most leverage now? Like in your, in your work with companies, because you are doing you, well, you're the founder of Cadabra, which is a consulting company, right? So, yes. um, you know, shout out to Cadabra. Thank you. You're welcome. And and so as you do consulting now, what are you seeing? And what are talk a little bit about some of the leadership challenges that you're seeing. I think that that's one of the key things that my audience likes to learn about is what about leadership? What should we be paying attention to? What is coming up? Especially at the time of this recording, we're coming out of a pandemic. And many people have found resources that they didn't know they had. They've yeah. also found problems they didn't know they had. So what are you seeing? Talk a little bit about what you've seen up to this point over the past year. What are you seeing now? And where do you think we're going? Mm, I, so many great questions <laughs> in there that you just that you just laid out, and I want to answer them all. But... I want you to answer them all. That's, <laughs> that's, that's so what we're doing you here. Could, you could keep me on track if I if I get off track, but um, I think I think to start, uh, 
I have to say that I, I'm, you know, one of the luckiest CEOs in the world because I lead an incredible team at Cadabra. And what I have realized about myself in doing leadership development work for the last 20 years is that I'm really good at building and leading teams. And I am happiest when I am not a solo practitioner consultant, but that I am really in that leading a team and building a business role in conjunction with leadership consulting. So I have the great privilege of doing all of that, although at times it it probably is me biting off a little more than I can chew. So that leads me to one of the great leadership challenges that I see, which is a lot of people right now, and I think in the last year have realized, leaders at every level, that we have a lot more work to do to make some fundamental changes in the world, in the way that we do business, in the way that we partner, uh, in the way that we reward people, both not just in terms of compensation, but in terms of opportunity. And a lot of leaders are not wired to be the most patient people on the planet. Mm. So we're impatient. We want to see those changes happen right now. And so I think one of the key challenges for leaders right now is not getting discouraged by the gap we can see between the vision of what's possible, what I believe is possible for us to move toward, and the current state, and giving ourselves permission to get there one step at a time and be really mindful about who are we bringing along with us. So the other challenge that a lot of leaders have is that we like to come up with an idea and then we're off and we're running. We are to the races and after we're half a mile down the road, we might look back and go, oh, wait, I'm supposed to bring some people along with me. So I think a great analogy for this past year, Wayne, is is when I think about how much change everyone has sort of had foist upon them, it's really a good time for leaders to be thoughtful about how saturated are people with change and are these additional changes that I want to drive? Am I approaching this in such a way that I am bringing the organization along with me, that I'm bringing our business partners along with me so that this is not just a solo act? Um, we have two sayings at Cadabra. One is that there are no solo acts at Cadabra. And number two is that we're better together. And I think both of those mantras really reflect how we do business with our clients, with our ecosystem partners, and how we want to show up. Fantastic. So I've been taking notes as you've been talking, and I love this. I love the question of how saturated are people with change? And I really think that over the past year, we've been, we've all been taking it it maybe a little personally, it's a pandemic. It's pan meaning it's global. It's not personal. Yeah. And yet we've each been tasked with getting through another day. And are we remote? Are we getting to go to the office? Do we get to go to a restaurant? Do we not get to go to a restaurant? Are we ma- masked? Are we vaxxed? Are we right. like all this stuff? Plus we're keeping the organization going forward. So how do we do that? You talked a little bit about um, having a vision and working with leaders who have a vision and they just go. And knowing that there is a cultural change, I want you to be specific about that, right? What are we seeing? It's we're moving away from the traditional, uh, the, the traditional organization that we saw from decades past. We're seeing we're seeing more diversity, we're seeing uh, more inclusion, and we're hoping for all of that, right? And yet, we're probably not seeing enough fast enough. So talk a little bit about how you encourage a vision of, of inclusion, and how are you talking about it? What kind of conversations are you having about that? Mm. 
it, you're right. And that part of the, the change that we think needs to happen in the world, whether it's the business ecosystem or beyond the business ecosystem, is a movement toward much greater equity and inclusion. And there is no shortcut to getting there. I think the the conversations that we're having, not just with clients, but internally, is it's not enough to say we want equity and inclusion. What are we actually doing in service of making that a reality? So what are some of the things that work? Well, yeah. what, what can you talk a little bit about what you're seeing that's working or some of the, some of the conversations you're having or some of the cultural shifts that are, that you're actually uh, guiding in terms of the do, because it is, it's great theory. And yeah. how do you get that change? How do you, you know, for most of my listeners aren't running their own companies, they're wanting to see a culture or live in a culture that in, that is more inclusive what are you doing with your with your leadership and what can the what can the mid level and line level employees be doing to work in terms of creating inclusion as well yeah it's uh Great question. And it really is an individual effort. So one of the things we talk about with our client organizations is what kind of support are you providing uh, to your frontline managers, your mid-level managers, your top leadership team? Is everyone engaged in this conversation? And there's a set of uh, either mindset shifts that need to occur there are some skills we need to build and there are behaviors that we need to cultivate and then reward and reinforce. So for example, a lot of companies uh, that we work with naturally gravitate toward, well, we better look at our hiring process. You know, how, who are we hiring? Are we hiring a diverse group of people? And what does that whole pipeline look like from the time they meet us to when we're making promotion decisions on for career development on on the other end and so things like what kind of interview questions do you ask or not are you including certain requirements in your job description that are discouraging people from applying uh, and we've done this at cadabra we used to have job descriptions that required four-year degrees and we stepped back last year and we said, why are we doing that? Because for most, most of these jobs, it's not about the degree. It's about the life experience and it's about the skill set that you bring and the values alignment. So there's a lot of small, tangible, concrete things that can happen as far as policies and procedures. But the net result of that has to be a shift in mindset, skill sets, and behaviors. So and so the other end would be, that's great if you're bringing in now a lot of diverse talent, but people are leaving two and three years into your organization. They're not being promoted and they're leaving to go somewhere else. You really haven't moved the needle. True. You've got diversity, but you don't have inclusion because people mm-hmm. don't feel like they belong there. So there's something else we have to get to. So can team members affect the the building of skill set and the values alignment can they can team members in any size organization create a bottom up kind of culture shift absolutely absolutely it's harder when you don't see really visible strong role modeling and leadership from the top um, that that is really important and helpful as a catalyst for this kind of change but sometimes it's not there or it's there, but it's too slow, right? It takes a while to percolate to, to, you know, the people that are closest to the customer. So if you're someone who is closer to the customer, then what I would say is recognize that all of us have the capacity to lead, whether I have leader in my job title 
or not. Leadership is, uh, it's influencing others in service of accomplishing something. It's just not for your own self-interest. So if you take that definition and try it on, then that sort of helps us unlock lots of things we can do individually. We can say, gee, uh, why are we asking that particular interview question? Or um, are we, um, you know, as we're thinking about doing different events, you know, for our team, let's say a team building session, is going bowling together the best idea? Maybe not. Um, are all of our um, activities around consuming alcohol? You know, maybe not the best idea. So, so there are lots of things that we can be more thoughtful of as individuals that we may have the ability to say, wait a minute, can we talk about this? It's almost back to empathy, right? It's back to, yeah. it's back to what am I missing by making assumptions? What am I missing by judging somebody a certain way? Uh, it's very interesting. The, the conversation hasn't changed much, right? right. Uh, it, it's very, it's, it's interesting. It's sad. It's, um, you know, from the time when I was starting in OD, it was several decades ago and organization development, I use acronyms and then I'll say it because not, not everybody listening or watching, right? <laughs> so when I started in organization development a few decades ago, it was, it was all about how do we get uh, how do we get a cultural engagement, and now we're at a place of not only cultural engagement but inclusion, and now we're going to remote first workplaces where it, it, there could or couldn't be a desk for me when I show back up at work. You know, right. I'm gonna be remote. How am I as a worker, how am I as a contributor going to be acknowledged on my team? There are all kinds of things that that need to happen. And that's the these are the discussions that need to be brought forth too. The the whole idea of um everyone's a leader. Like that's important. Everyone's a leader. Uh how Whether do you, you realize it or not? Right. You are influencing someone else all the time through your words and your actions. So isn't it better if we are aware of that and intentional about that? We're anchoring that to our why, you know, to to a to a greater purpose than just sort of going about our day and, and not being really present to what is that impact that we're having. That's such a congruent message with what I've been it's one of the reasons I wanted you on was, was really a long, like for you to be able to say that is that everyone's a leader. You're being watched. You're influencing others. You're influenced by others. Can we get back to the big why, which is the, the like the big why for an organization is the values based vision, not some grand uh, BHAG goal, the big hairy right. audacious goal it's what's that founded in? Who are we as an organization? What do we believe in? So and the, important. Right. And the best employees then also, or team members, uh, depending on what they're called. I'm, I'm allergic to the word staff. Um, the best <laughs> staff. It's like, that's horrible <laughs> to my mind. Um, uh, I like team the, members. I use yeah, that a lot. Yeah. yeah. The best team members are, are those that feel a, a sense of ownership. What are some best practices for leaders? What are they doing when we talk about the do now? What are they doing and what are you guiding them to do? Like one of the things that I like to do on this sh on this show, the One Sharp Sword podcast is to talk about leadership lessons. So if you were to say, "All right, you know what? Here are some like two or three do things for our uh, for our leaders and for team members that aren't in a position of power, right? You still have power, even though you don't have, maybe have title. So right. here's some things you can do. I think the first thing that, that undergirds 
a lot of the challenges we've been talking about, whether it is, you know, how are we going to make a hybrid work environment work for us? Or how are we going to create a more equitable and inclusive culture at our organization? Or in some cases, how are we going to stay in business? How are we going to continue to be relevant as a business as things are shaking out post-pandemic? I think the thing that undergirds all of that and that that I, I spend a lot of time talking with leaders about, and my team spends a lot of time talking with leaders about, is this idea of having a, a curiosity about what's going on in yourself and what's going on in others. And it's really important to pair that curiosity with kindness. So back to empathy, as we talked earlier, it's not, it's not curiosity that is where, um, you know, we want to understand something better so we can argue against it. It's the kind of curiosity that comes from a genuine desire to, to understand. So really important for equity and inclusion to acknowledge that we have privilege. A lot of people don't like the P word and they're very uncomfortable with it. However, if that's happening for you, like a, as you're listening to this, if you're thinking, ooh, yeah, privilege, I, I don't like to talk about that. The question is, notice that and say, what don't I yet understand that's Love causing it. me to have this reaction? So I think that is the, the mindset that we have to really be intentional about cultivating right now. Regardless of what kind of change we're talking about, that's going to help us show up better as leaders, whether again, you've got the title or you don't have the title. Um, I love this. I love it so much um, because those who know me know that I basically travel everywhere with a stuffed little monkey called Curious George. I've been- I love Curious George. Exactly, right? So <laughs> I've been known to put a curious George at the head of a boardroom table and somebody goes, what's with the monkey? And I go, it's not a monkey. It's not any monkey. It's, and somebody will go, well, it's George. And it's not just George. It's, and somebody else will go, it's curious George. And it's like, that's where we start. We start with curiosity. And yes. for me, w I lay that as a ground rule. If we live in curiosity, we stay out of judgment. That's so the, right. Right. So the question of, well, what am I missing? Um, why, why would this person present this way? Or if I'm having some reaction to the privilege word, what is that about? What am I, what am I afraid of losing? Right. Most people, yes. most people, when they get to a place of bristling or wanting to hold on tighter are trying to hold on to something that may or may not need to be held on to that that um needs to be looked at right so so to set that as a ground rule let's just stay curious let's engage in this as a conversation right so that's yes. part of leadership development is how do you build a better leader you you build in curiosity as a new leadership trait and yes right, and right? along so, with that i think that the, you know, if we visualize this as a train, you know, leadership is, is a, a train of cars that all, that all link together and they're all part of that train. I would say the car that would, would link right next to curiosity is what we call growth mindset. So not only are we curious, but we have a fundamental belief. And, and sometimes we have to work hard to cultivate this, that we can always learn we can always grow. And that is also important. It's this idea that we're never really done learning. That if something's difficult or hard for us, that could be an indicator that we need to adjust something and try again, not necessarily when we need to stop. So this is, this is a really important point because this is a human condition. Yes. Uh, you're referencing the growth mindset, which is Carol Dweck. And, yes. um, and she, in her book, she talks about the difference between growth versus fixed mindset. Right. 
the places where I've seen leaders blow it big time is when they say, I'm fine. It's everybody else that needs to grow. Yes. Right. It's, and I've seen that not only in leadership, but also in uh, relationships, right. In couples, in families, in communities, in politics, I'm fine. Everybody else needs to just figure out my point of view. Right. Uh, and and <laughs> the world would be great if everyone just thought like I think. And yes. Made choices like I make choices and I, have the same ideas. I actually heard that uh, when I was consulting. <laughs> I, I it um, believe it. My jaw dropped. It's like we're talking about collaboration, and. And I was talking to a, a senior leader and he basically said, well, I'm good at collaborating. If everybody would do it my way, then we'd all <laughs> be able to collaborate just fine. And he was dead serious. He was serious. Wow. Yeah. So that's something to really keep in mind is um, do you as an individual, right? So for our audience members, as an individual, do you seek to grow every day? Do you seek to learn something new every day? Do you seek to uh, engage in conversation in a way you haven't before or meet somebody new? And these are the kinds of things that I like to bring to the audience to, and, and because I bring them to myself. You know, it's one of those, who did I meet? today that I wouldn't have otherwise met. And uh, today I've met two different people. One is you and one is uh, an interview I did with somebody earlier and um, amazing, right? Amazing growth, completely different cultures uh, the, are potentially explored. And, and I think that's where we grow, right? Tell me that. about your culture. Yes. Um, I think that's so huge. Do you want to talk about you? <laughs> You have this great book coming out. It's um, Learn, Lead, Lift, How to Think, Act, and Inspire Your Way to Greatness. Uh, this is, it is released this May, as in uh, at the time of this recording, we're in May of 2021. And so it's coming out this month, Learn, Lead, Lift. And can you talk a little bit about, about that? What what will a reader get from learn, lead, lift? That's a lot of L's, you know. It, it is a lot of L's. <laughs> Some people love the alliteration and other people are, you know, not I'm a so fan. sure yet. I am a fan of alliteration. <laughs> it's just, as I was saying it, it's like learn, lead, lift. Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, and and come to learn because this is my my first book coming out. So uh, talk about having to have a growth mindset over the last few years. I've learned so many things. And one of them is that actually how you title a book is a thing. And there are people who specialize in figuring out what you should call your book. Um, I don't know that I availed myself of that wonderful wisdom necessarily, but we'll go with it. And I would say that Learn, Lead, Lift was really born out of, uh, first of all, I'll give you the, the personal reason and then the professional reason. So the personal reason is that back in 2018, I was looking at the number five zero on a birthday coming up. And as many people do who are looking at that age, um, and if you're a person of privilege, as I must acknowledge that I am, I could entertain some different things. Do I want to have a party? Do I want to take a trip? Uh, what what do I want to do to celebrate that that I'm still here and that I still can contribute in the world? And uh, the thought came to me, what I really want to do is I want to honor the people I've worked with, the people I've learned from, and I want to lift up uh, some of these ideas and epiphanies and insights that I feel like have been so helpful for me and for my clients in the last 20 years. And so that was really the personal genesis. It was um, my, my birthday gift to myself and to others that, that I feel like have touched my life in profound ways. The professional side of me said, you know, I'm curious. I'm really curious to know if 
all these insights and ideas I have are the same kinds of ideas and insights that an artist would have, or an athlete, or a teacher, or a therapist. So why don't I go and talk to a bunch of people who I've never worked with, who come from different life experiences and different career trajectories, and ask them what they think great leadership looks like. And so that's what I did. And so I did my own sort of research study, if you will, of of seeking out those different perspectives. And so Learn, Lead, Lift is the the culmination of all of that put together. Think about a soup with about 100 ingredients, and there you go. Awesome. What are some of the lessons that someone might learn from picking this up? So I think the, the framework that came out of that was, as I mentioned earlier, I, I think about leadership. There are, there are three elements in this framework. One is mindsets, so how you think. The second is skill sets, which is what do you know or what do you know how to do? And then the third is behaviors. And that's how are you showing up to others? I might think that I'm being decisive. But if nobody else on my team experiences me that way, we have a problem. So within this framework, if we if we think about those three buckets, it starts to get a lot easier to see, oh, you know what? The last number of years in leadership development, we talk a lot about skills. Then we started talking a lot about behaviors. And we've started to talk about mindsets, but that's relatively new to the party. So I think it's important to look at all three of those areas and everyone is going to have strengths within those three buckets and areas of opportunity or places that they want to grow. And so the book's really intended to be a very practical guide through those buckets and to really help you think and then take action quickly. So that if you realize, aha, I think that's an area where I could grow. You've got some immediate suggestions at the end of each chapter to say, here's what you can do about it. That's awesome. Uh, It's it's almost, I love the framework, mindset, uh, skill set, and behaviors. And it's almost like you're asking for a personal SWOT analysis, a strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats analysis in each bucket. Yes. That's fantastic. Great analogy. I love that. <laughs> it's, um, it's really so important, right? If you can do a, a self-analysis of how do you think and then validate that against how do other people think you think. If you can do a self-analysis of your skill set, well, I think I'm pretty good at this and other people are like, eh, you know, not so great. <laughs> right. uh, or yeah, <laughs> this person's the, the best at that. And we all follow this person's lead. And then behaviors, you know, the, <laughs> some of the, some of the leaders I've worked with have these conversations in their head before they get to work so that when they get to work, they're like, you suck. And then it's sort of like hit, hit and run sort of leadership. Yeah. Um, and rather than, Hey, I was thinking about this, we have this problem and I would like to call attention to this. How do we solve this versus come out with some kind of horrible judgment? And then it's like, um, yeah, hit and run. It's like, (laughs) yes, it feels that way. Yeah. That's how people experience us when as leaders, we, that's how we choose to show up and communicate. And for some, it surprised me because they believe that that's strong leadership. Well, I told them what to do. I told them how they were doing. It's like, that's not leadership. That's bullying. And that's not okay. That's not leading. Um, that's beating people down into submission. That's not a great way of, of leading. Um, I, I often use the, the analogy with, with leaders that said, you know, people and teams are human systems, right? And human systems are like biological systems. Okay. They're, they're, they're organic. And I think a lot of our models and theories, um, lean more toward mechanistic, 
you know, especially if you've been trained in the, the sciences, you know, engineering, math, in a mechanical system, we can predict that if I put, you know, this, these are the inputs, and then I add this color at stage five, this is what's going to happen as outputs. It's very predictable each time. With human systems, it's totally different. So I can do what you just described, Wayne, and I can show up and say, <laughs> you know, you suck. And one person that might really light a fire under them. And they may be like, I better go make 10 more sales calls because the boss is really mad. Person B sitting right next to them might put their head down on the desk and start crying. So person C might walk out and decide they're going to go get another job. So as leaders, when we're mindful of the fact that we can say the exact same thing to three different people and get three different results. We start to, to realize the limits of approaching everything in that very mechanical format. And the possibility and opportunity to grow when we, right. when we do recognize that a human system is a biological and therefore organic system and that, and that all life seeks more life. Right. Mechanisms don't. So this is huge. That's, um, there's the profound nugget. That's awesome. <laughs> Anything else you would love to, uh, to talk about? Anything I haven't asked you that you hoped I would or that you're like, oh, you know what? Here's how people find me or learn more about the book. I want to make sure that, that we talk about we are Kadabra and Kadabra is spelled with a K. Uh, so that, yes, so that people can find you. We are Kadabra.com is a great place to find Wendy Ryan is my guest. Um, what else am I missing? Mm. How was that for a curious question? What am I, <laughs> what am I missing, Wendy? <laughs> well, I would say that, um, you know, I mentioned mindsets as kind of a newer guest to the party as we think about leadership development. And one of the, the mindsets that I talk about in the book is what I like to call identity matters. And I mention that because this is something that was not part of the conversation when I was first in HR or even first in leadership development. So I think that is one of the more challenging mindsets and one of the more necessary mindsets for leaders right now and into the future. So for a lot of that, I also want to recognize it means some of us have to really unlearn a lot of things we were originally taught, like we weren't supposed to focus on identity. That's a big shift. So I think that you can do a lot of this work to become a better leader and a, and a better human by yourself we also need to do some of this work in community. So whether that is with a coach, with a friend, with a peer, with a counselor, um, seek out those people who are gonna positively encourage you to go on a journey and stay on a journey of knowing yourself better, understanding other people better, and then what are you gonna do with that? What's the impact you wanna have in the world with that new awareness and understanding? What's you're gonna be your due out of that? Um, and I think that that's a great starting point. I think if people reading the book can really go into that, everything else is easier. I'd agree. That's great. Yeah. Identity matters is... That'd be a great title for a book. That's a chapter. You could write a whole book on it. You yes. totally could. So that's a chapter within learn, lead, lift. Yes. Okay. It's one of the mindsets we talk about. And, Good deal. Um, I think it's so important, especially it's, right now. It's really important. And you're talking about everything from ethnicity to gender identity to like all of that in terms of identity. So we've been talking in, in, more general terms on this show currently. And I just want to make sure that, that that's clear that it's, 
it's an important conversation to have, right? Yes. That, that when we say, you know, let's talk about identity. It's not just like, well, who are you and where'd you come from? And <laughs> it's, right. it's what matters to you. How are you feeling about showing up in a certain way? Who do you want to be? How do you want to be? How do you want to express yourself? And how do you want to do that in the workplace as well as in the community? And I think that the, that is a, it's a beautifully dangerous place to be walking. And I love that. I, you know, it's, these are conversations that we haven't had enough of. And um, we're at that place. We're at that place. And I, I look forward to seeing what happens in 20 years when we're beyond saying, oh, we're at that place now. Um, because we've had other conversations that seem to have continued since the fifties and sixties. And it's, it's, you know, I'm at the place of going, well, it's about time. Like right. we need to be at that place. Absolutely. So, right. So this is great. This is really great. Um, what else, what else would you like to bring up? What else would you like to uh, talk about? What, uh, what, final comments or bullet points or ways of contacting you would, would you like to put out there? Well, you already mentioned uh, one way to get a hold of me is to visit the wearecadabra.com website. Uh, there is also a website for the book, which is www.learnleadlift.com. You can see a video of me there talking about why I wrote the book and the impact I hope it will have. You can also connect with me there and ask a question about leadership or, or anything that you're curious about with the book. And uh, lots of resources for where you can purchase or download resources for free. So uh, one of the, my goals with the book was also to make the information in it accessible for everyone. So uh, you don't feel like you have to spend money in order to benefit from the learning and the conversation. So I really encourage people to engage, you know, engage with us and let's see where we can go together um, with that spirit of curiosity and kindness and desire to make positive impact. I have nothing to add to that. Let's see where we can go with yeah. the spirit of curiosity, kindness, and a desire to make positive impact. That's awesome. We will leave it there. Wendy Ryan, my guest today, thank you for joining us. It's really Thank great. you for having me. It's been so, such a pleasure. It is a pleasure. This is One Sharp Sword. I'm Wayne Purnell, your host, your guide you, on this amazing journey. <laughs> Uh, thank you for being here and um, we will see you and or have you listen the next time around. <laughs>